Well, a new year is always a great time for stock taking. There are new hopes for the Indian economy in terms of probably lower crude prices, uh, a nascent private capex cycle ticking up, and perhaps cheaper cost of capital. On the other hand, there are new challenges, especially from the global scenario where liquidity could be tightening, uh, where uh, perhaps trade wars could still make space a little difficult for us, probably slower growth for the global economy as well, and especially for the two big economies, the US and the Chinese economies. How do all this tie up in terms of uh, uh, you know, prospects for the Indian economy? We're going to ask someone who is best placed uh, to answer that. Uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, economist, environmentalist, author, urban realist, and of course, principal advisor uh, to the finance ministry. Sanjeev, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, actually, let us start with the global because uh, every day we are getting bombarded with either tweets or an extremely volatile Wall Street indices. Uh, how are you looking at the uh, uh, 2019? Are we going to see this balance sheet crunching by global central banks uh, beginning to make uh, uh, the cost of money expensive? Is it a difficult 2019 for us as far as the world is concerned? Uh, let me begin by wishing everyone a very prosperous and happy 2019. And a very happy birthday to you, uh, Lata, as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me, uh, yeah. So the world, uh, as we look forward into it, yes, uh, certainly there are a lot of uncertainties. Uh, but um, on the other hand, um, you know, some things have also flowed our way. For example, Oil prices have come off a long way from when they peaked in um, uh, October, November. If you remember, they were at 85. Now we are looking at 53. So much better. Mm. Um, yes, there are some uh, apprehensions about the world economy slowing down. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, remember, uh, the US Fed uh, has suggested that it will probably tighten mm. somewhat uh, at a pace that's somewhat less steep mm. than had otherwise been, mm. which, by the way, is very good for us because mm. it means that um, you know, the global liquidity conditions of anything will be somewhat easier than mm. we had earlier anticipated. Okay. There may still be some tightening, mm. but much easier than people had anticipated earlier. Mm. Okay. Uh, yes, of course, trade wars make things uh, uncertain. Yeah. Uh, but again, as I said, um, not entirely gloomy. I mean, there are uh, areas where if uh, we in India, uh, you know, mm. Uh, look, uh, look at it positively and mm. try and find ways in which okay. uh, India can, you know, uh, insert itself into a new uh, uh, global supply chain that may be emerging out of these trade wars, mm -hmm. uh, then in fact we can take advantage of it. So I would argue that yes, there are some challenges, but um, there are many areas where in fact India can take advantage of the situation from lower energy prices, somewhat easier uh, in global interest rates, and perhaps a liquefied global supply chain where we can insert ourselves. So, and many other things as well. So okay. I think not really such a gloomy picture of the world as uh, maybe somebody else would have told you. <laughs> All right. No, no, actually, I, I want to connect this to the book that your forthcoming book, India in the Age of Ideas, where you are, I think, trying to define a new role for India, understanding uh, uh, India's uh, uh, history in a new context. But I'll come to that in just a bit. Let's first explore uh, the economy themes of 2019 and then come uh, to how we should relook ourselves uh, in a new global order. Uh, you know, the Indian economy itself, uh, the, the most immediate news that we are getting is that the fiscal deficit is now 114% of the full year budget. It normally tends to be higher in the months of uh, November, December and gets corrected as advanced taxes come in in the last quarter. But nevertheless, it's a, a slightly higher number than we are used to as early as November. Plus, we hear that the government is planning some kind of a farm support, maybe a basic income, maybe a waiver, maybe some way of supporting uh, farm prices. Uh, it does look like fiscal deficit is going to get much bigger than we thought. Uh, let me just uh, clarify that we continue to remain very much committed to fiscal consolidation. Mm. So we are not uh, you know, contemplating uh, moving away from that commitment. Okay. Uh, as far as the farm sector is concerned, I think we need to be uh, clear that, you see, what is the issue that the farm sector is facing? Um, in the past, the problem used to be uh, for drought or floods or whatever, mm. weather-related factors, we used to be a, a shortage country. Mm. Now what has happened, ironically because of our own success, in fact, mm. in increasing mm. uh, farm production, 
we have ended up in a situation where we are producing a lot more food mm. than we could possibly consume. Mm. So this whole 1960s green revolution approach to agriculture that we used to have mm. uh, is basically run its course. We mm. now produce way more food than we could consume or store. And so we need to relook at that. Now, how do we transition away from this let's grow more calories approach to mm. agriculture? Okay. Now, first thing, short term, we need to make sure that the fact that there is this excess is leading to food prices being under continuous mm. Uh, yes. pressure downwards. That's right. We need to deal with that. Okay. So agrarian reform more than an agrarian revolution or a green revolution uh, uh, is what you're talking about. Uh, but important for me is that uh, you reiterate that fiscal deficit in spite of whatever farm supports we give uh, will not get disturbed. We, your, the government is still uh, looking at 3.3 percent. We will. We are committed to the 3.3 percent. Of course, there may be some variation mm. around it, mm. but uh, you know the variations that we d uh, are will be very minor. I mean, okay. Okay. this is not the days where we used to debate five and six percent of no, GDP. No no. no, no, certainly not. <laughs> certainly nowhere near that. Uh, but uh, uh, let me come to the cost of capital itself. Uh, like you said, uh, uh, that we have got a severe food disinflation, which is actually been surprising. Uh, one thought that MSPs would perhaps increase the prices, that has not happened. And now to add to that, we also have a fuel disinflation. So what do you look at in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how much uh, uh, rate cuts can come? We already have a fairly comfortable liquidity with the Reserve Bank promising uh, 50,000 crore of uh, uh, bond purchases, uh, December, Jan, Feb and March. Uh, to add to that, how much space for rate cuts do you see in 2019? Uh, for firstly, let me clarify that this is really the um, prerogative of the Monetary Policy Committee, so mm. I can't um, comment on exactly how much they should uh, cut, mm. but I can lay out the mm. landscape. Okay. Uh, basically, inflation is now running at the bottom of the uh, range uh, that the uh, Monetary Policy Committee had been given, mm. and uh, we have now, it's just not something new, we have mm. now had for some time mm. uh, inflation uh, running at or below the midpoint of that range. Opposite. So inflation, I think, has structurally come off. I think it's fair to say mm. that the old uh, 7 or 8 to 10 percent range mm. uh, that we, of inflation that we used to have, that has been lowered by some good, you know, five, six hundred basis points. Mm. Um, so if that is the case, mm. we need to see a commensurate reduction mm. in the nominal interest rates. Otherwise, mm. you mm. have real interest rates running about the highest in the world. Mm. I mean, small business still borrows at 12 percentage points, right? Mm. Mm. Now, if inflation is running at 2 percent, that's a thousand basis point uh, real, um, interest real interest rate. Clearly, uh, some th yeah, a thousand basis point, at least an 800 basis point real interest rate for large parts of the economy. Mm. This is clearly not tenable because of a variety of reasons. First of all, mm. this is a source of <clears throat> enormous financial stress to the balance sheets. Mm. So this is a major problem for uh, small business, large business, mm. for farmers. After all, farmers can also be seen as small business mm, yep. um, and so on. It also causes stress on our fiscal side mm. because the government is, the, after all, the biggest borrower yep. from the system. So it is a stress on the fiscal side. <clears throat> but also, ironically, mm. Keeping high interest rates over long periods of time also increases inflation. Mm. This is something that economists tend to forget. Okay. That while high interest rates in the medium term lowers inflation, mm. in the long run, high interest rates mean that you do not build capacities Fair that you point. would have otherwise built, mm. whether infrastructure, in, in industry, and so on. Mm. So you end up with higher supply side mm. inflation in the long run yep. if you keep interest rates high indefinitely, irrespective mm. of where inflation is. Yep. So I think we have structurally brought down inflation. Mm. We now need to take step two and structurally bring down the interest rates mm. so that they are in sync with the new level of uh, inflation. Mm. And that, when I say, when we have to think in hundreds of basis points now, yep. they exactly what trajectory the MPC takes, of course, is their prerogative. Mm. No, a fair point. It's just that uh, uh, I, I would assume that the N MPC would be convinced of uh, the food disinflation that they have seen and the fuel disinflation, especially if uh, you know crude continues around this $55 mark uh, uh, all the way up to February when the MPC meets next. But more importantly, they will worry if fiscal deficit is higher than they thought. 
uh, for instance, we have seen a spate of farm loan waivers coming in from the state governments. In addition, if a big package comes from the center, that would be a spot of bother for MPC, won't it? So I, I would argue that you know the, the, you cannot see these things in isolation. But, you know, the, the, I mean, one of the points I make in my new book mm. is that uh, the, you have to think about the system in, in, in a holistic way mm. because the, everything is connected. Yep. If you keep real interest rates at these high levels mm. for the farmers, mm. naturally there will uh, be pressure to uh, do farm loan waivers Waiver. and other things. Okay. So you make cost of capital exceptionally high, mm. then it feeds through, to, you know, the imbalance shows through somewhere in the system. Sure. So the point is once you have lowered uh, food prices uh, and inflation generally, you have to allow the rest of the system to adjust. Mm. Otherwise, the political pressure or other economic pressures will show up somewhere. Okay. So these are not unconnected things. Okay, fair point. Uh, well, let me come to the other space uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, that was a problem, but uh, increasingly a lot of NBFC guys, we had Rasesh Shah on the channel, the Fiki head, and he heads a big uh, uh, NBFC as well, telling us that the debt problem is not as serious as it was uh, at all. KK Mistri said much the same thing. Do you think that that NBFC problem is now resolved? Well, it certainly eased up a lot from mm. where it was if you go back to uh, October. October. Mm. Um, if you remember, we had, the, of course, it got triggered with ILFS. Mm. Uh, we in the government moved very quickly mm. and we ring-fenced it. But by that time, of course, the impact of that had gone into the credit market mm. and the credit market had begun to freeze over. Now, this is, you know, in India, we tend to spend a lot of time thinking about the stock market, mm. having the equity markets. Yeah. But credit markets, very few people look at. Mm. Whereas, in fact, the credit market is the heart of the economy in many ways. Mm. And so this was actually something we paid a lot of attention to, mm. especially since we were seeing that there was a lot of problems with rolling over and mm. so on. Um, and, of course, we uh, took a lot of steps. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to see that that rollover problem has substantially abated. Mm. This is not to suggest that uh, we do not watch this carefully still. We continue to watch it very, very, very carefully. Okay. But um, uh, for the time being, uh, it appears that the NBFC situation mm. has eased very substantially. Mm. Mm. We also have a good news in that the banking sector, mm. which has not been lending for several years, has begun to lend again. Yes. So, you know, the so uh, credit which the NBFC sector may have tightened up, mm -hmm. the banking sector has begun to uh, mm -hmm. pull in. And of course, we have uh, additionally, you have, um, you know, we have just recapitalized many of these banks yes. um, and so on. Large OMOs have been done to put uh, liquidity back in by the Reserve Bank. So all of these things together have eased up the situation very substantially. Okay. No, absolutely. Uh, the uh, banking system's uh, credit growth is the highest, I believe, since uh, December 2013 at 15.6% when, when the RBI last announced the number. So clearly, uh, banks are coming in where, uh, into the space that uh, NBFCs have, uh, uh, are vacating or at least have contracted. Uh, but do you think a special line of credit is needed for NBFCs? That was the kind of demand uh, uh, that uh, that lobby apparently made uh, to the Prime Minister. But uh, the Reserve Bank Act allows a line of credit only against government securities. That is in the Act itself. Uh, besides, since the biting part of the problem is over, uh, do you think just allowing liquidity is enough or a special line of liquidity is called for? Well, certainly uh, generalized liquidity needs to be managed and the RBI is well aware of that. You may have seen the OMOs and other yes. things have been ramped up. Um, uh, whether or not uh, NBFCs need a special window of credit or something, well, I'll, obviously that is not for me to say. Okay. Um, the uh, Governor Das will take a view on that. Okay. All right. What would your worry be about uh, infrastructure in general? You know, we have seen the private capex cycle kicking off, but uh, larger infrastructure, who will uh, actually finance? We're seeing a reasonable amount of risk aversion in the banking system, primarily because of the catharsis they have come through, the IBC process, and even, of course, a lot of investigation uh, that happened uh, in the past two years. Uh, do you think that there will be a problem? Uh, people are talking about already fresh power capacity that needs to be planned. There were reports that came from Credit Suisse and CLSA saying that in four years, we may actually start talking about power shortages if we don't start investment. Uh, do you think we'll have a problem there in terms of finding uh, investors for uh, uh, long-term projects? 
So we always, we of course remain uh, committed to creating more capacities for infrastructure, whether it's power, roads, and so on. I mean, some very large projects have just got <coughs> completed, <coughs> and um, so on. So. Uh, you are seeing, uh, you know, uh, a large amount of investment going into infrastructure. It's not like uh, we are withdrawing in any way. And, of course, the private sector is more than welcome to come in and participate. There have been, it is true, uh, problems in the past uh, with certain, uh, certain projects. Um, and, of course, the IBC process has been um, put into place in order to take uh, uh, into account and liquefy them where necessary. Mm. And, uh, you know, appropriate action will be taken where, uh, whatever, wherever necessary. Okay. But, uh, you know, of course, uh, the government requires private participation and it also requires the financial institutions of various kinds to take part. Mm. Um, whether it is the banks or perhaps, um, you know, other new institutions uh, which are specialized in uh, okay. long-term mm. lending. Uh, you have a new institution, for example, like NIIF, mm. which has raised money, but it is now beginning to deploy it. Okay. Okay. I wanted to ask you about the other big success story of 2018, uh, the IBC, the Bankruptcy Code. About uh, 1 lakh crore has come to, into the coffers of banks, but uh, uh, looked at it another way, especially towards the last few months of 2018, the IBC process has also disappointed. Of the 12 marquee cases that were sent to them, only two have gotten fully resolved and a third is probably on its way. But, uh, you know, the big cases like SR have not been, and the queue has already come in. So there are two kinds of problems that IBC faces. The, uh, you know, stacking up of cases, the queuing up of cases, and the fact that it is getting caught in the uh, legal process as well, with uh, some uh, challenges being uh, uh, dragged to the Supreme Court. Uh, would you worry that securing this process is one of the big challenges of 2019? No, of course, it's a new process. Uh, we always watch it very carefully to make sure that the process uh, uh, moves as smoothly as possible. But let me say that, uh, you know, the actual gains from the insolvency and bankruptcy code are much more than uh, uh, just the um, uh, monies that you mentioned. Mm. Um, first of all, it has radically changed business culture in this country. Sure. This idea that you can uh, take large loans and squat on them and not have an expectation of repaying, that is literally gone. Mm. So I think that is a major, major thing. Uh, secondly, we also have a culture where if there is business failure, which mm. may be for an entirely legitimate reason, mm. we have now got a much more, uh, what should I say, creative destruction view of uh, uh, mm. economics. So if a business goes wrong, then we liquefy it in mm. whichever way, whether it's resolution or uh, 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 yeah. liquidation. And these assets are then redeployed again. Yeah. So this is a structural change in the framework of how we think about our economy. So that's, let, let's leave that aside, although that's a very important change. In addition to, of course, uh, the uh, about 69,000 crores that has come back mm. uh, from actual resolution, yes. uh, there is also further uh, uh, gains. For mm. example, about 1 lakh uh, crores has come back I, uh, from even outside or yes. before the IBC, sure. uh, from those who were otherwise uh, being made NPAs but are mm. now coming back to repay, yes. or those who had become non-standard who mm. are now and become delayed payments and coming back. So, again, a part of this business culture change, about one lakh crore in addition has come back. Okay. Another 1.2 lakh crores is somewhere in the process which is being brought into mm. IBC but then some resolution has uh, taken place without actually going all the way to the end of the process. So in all, I would say some 3 lakh crores worth of uh, debt mm. that was in some sort of a problem uh, it has come back uh, as a result of the new IBC process. So I would say this is a huge, huge change. But of course, this 3 lakh crores is only a small part of what has been achieved, which, as I said, was a business culture change, which I think will stand us in good stead over the next generation, not just for the next year. Okay. Oh, yes, uh, it should. One only hopes that it doesn't get clogged like previous experiments uh, in uh, uh, bad loan treatment uh, uh, got into. Uh, uh, Sanjeev, the other big story of 2019 is going to be the general election. Now, elections are obviously chitya, but it can go uh, heads or tails. Uh, do you think the economy can be disturbed if there is a change in government or if the same government comes back with a lesser majority? Uh, how much can political dissonance disturb the economic cycle? 
Well, I'm not in a position to comment on uh, political changes, but let me say we are an institutional, uh, institutionalized democracy. Governments have come and gone over the last 25 years and uh, reforms have gone on. Mm. So uh, I would say that uh, India's prospects look good. Mm. Um, we are, as, a, uh, as is well known, um, the fastest growing economy uh, in the world, mm. um, growing much faster incidentally than China. Yeah. And more importantly, uh, we are managing to sustain these 7% plus GDP growth rates mm. without any stress. So inflation is in fact too low as we just discussed. Yes. Um, current account deficit is now probably at 2% of GDP or, Absolutely. and is likely to fall if oil prices remain where they are. And there is actually space in our interest rates to actually accelerate growth. Yeah. In fact, the discussion we had about in, you know, cost of capital being high, what does it mean? We are growing with these costs of capital. Just Absolutely. imagine lowering the cost of capital a few hundred basis points mm. and what kind of growth we can generate. So we have been through many changes. Uh, the banking system is up and running again. So I would say that we are well positioned for growth rates in excess of 8% over the next few years if we play our cards even even moderately well. All oh, right. Oh, well, that's the, a, a great way to end this conversation. But no, I have to get to your book. And I'll tell you, you know, your book comes at a very interesting time when the global economy, global political economy is seriously changing. We are once again getting into a bipolar world, uh, a la US, USSR. But uh, here the US-China relations, uh, how, however antagonistic they get, have to be different because the two have deep investments in each other. Also, we are entering a, a, a time when, uh, you know, probably trade wars are going to become the language. I mean, mu multilateralism is probably going to give way to bilateralism. How do you see India's place? And what is your book, uh, what is the message from your book in terms of India's role in a new global world? So the book is called uh, India in the Age of Ideas. And the fundamental point about this world is that we live in a world that is continuously changing. So the way to navigate this world for India is to be less dogmatic about exactly where this world will go. Mm. Flexibility and our ability to adapt matter a lot more than our ability to forecast where this will go and uh, so much better to look around us and respond quickly than to have some pre uh, some idea where this world is predestined. Mm -hmm. Now, this is particularly important to think about because of the, the, the kind of situation we find ourselves, which you just described, mm. a world that is liquefying in multiple levels mm. into a different environment. Mm. We actually do not know what, what are the unintended consequences, the butterfly effects that mm. you will have as a result of this new environment. Absolutely. So I would say, let us not prejudge where this is going to go. What matters is that we respond quickly to whatever the new opportunities that emerge out of this, whether it is from artificial intelligence or for trade wars. For us, do not try to protect the old ways of doing things. Uh, Sandeep Sanyal, you've drawn up a fairly optimistic 2019 uh, cost of capital uh, likely to fall, current account deficit likely to be under control, and a promise that fiscal deficit will be kept in check, and uh, an Indian growth story that will be able to weather even political storms. Thank you very much, Sanjeev Sanyal, for joining us. Have a great 2019 yourself. And like in your previous books, may this one also be a box office hit. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.